first. In the 1920s, Hollywood, in a surge of sophistication, imported filmmakers from Europe by the steamer full. Continental directors jumped at the chance for more money and expertise, and they tended to bring with them their leading ladies, like Hungarian Vilma Banki. And German-bred Camilla Horn, brought by German-bred F.W. Murnau, director of The Last Laugh and Sunrise. L.B. Mayer imported Swedish director Moritz Stiller and his star. But the first of the foreign beauties in Hollywood had been Pola Negri, brought by Ernst Lubitsch. In films like Forbidden Paradise, Negri, here with Valentino in his residential paradise, Falcon's Lair, had set the neo-European sybaritic style of the moment. But if stars could be imported, they could be exported. With the screen still silent, there was no voice or foreign accent problem either way. And the first to go from Hollywood to the continent was Louise Brooks. She had been seen in this 1928 American film, A Girl in Every Port, by German director G.W. Pabst, who had been searching for the right girl to play the seductive, self-destructive Lulu in Pandora's Box, his screen version of the famous Lulu plays. Louise, a child dancing prodigy, had left her Cherry Vale, Kansas home at age 15 to enroll in the Dennis Shawn Dance Project in New York. She was adopted by a smart Park Avenue clique and the intellectuals of the Algonquin Round Table. By age 18, she had danced in George White's Scandals and the Ziegfeld Follies. By 19, under contract to famous players Lasky, later Paramount, she had made six pictures in the Astoria, New York studios. Titles like An American Venus and Love Em and Leave Em. In 1927 and 8, she made another half dozen films in Hollywood, such as Rolled Stockings, City Gone Wild, and this one. A Girl in Every Port would launch Brooks for the biggest splash of her career. In it, she is billed by the carnival as Mamzelle Godiva, Neptune's bride and the sweetheart of the sea. And in the story, she's not only the sweetheart of the sea, she's the sweetheart of the two seamen, Victor McLaughlin and Robert Armstrong. The direction of A Girl in Every Port was by Howard Hawks, and the film set the pattern of the Hawks films in which two robust men are attracted by one flirtatious woman and wind up together rather than with the woman. returned to Hollywood after three films in Europe, producers would brand her the most difficult girl in the world and an amoral pleasure lover like Mademoiselle Godiva. Half a century later, Brooks would reminisce, quote, being a born loner who was temporarily deflected from the hermit's path by a career in theater and films, I can state categorically that there was no other occupation in the world that so closely resembled enslavement as the career of a film star." Unquote. In recalling autobiographically the contradiction between her private solitude and her public seductivity, she proved to be not only a born loner, but a born writer. Hollywood hard hearters had pegged her in the beautiful but dumb category and her frustration was that she was sure they were right about beautiful and wrong about dumb.
some historians were to see it from another angle. They suggest that Brooks was dumb when, returning from her stunning success abroad, she independently tried to dictate her own terms. That, in what she herself later described as her, quote, cruel pursuit of truth and excellence as an executioner of the bogus, unquote, she invited her own excommunication. But whether with dumbness or commendable independence, capped by the hedonism of her off-screen lifestyle, Louise Brooks was as self-destructive as Lulu and wrecked her own career, if she really wanted one, by being temperamental at exactly the wrong time. Hers was a career as insecure as Bob Armstrong's blanket, and it fell into three fast phases. First, in America between 1925 and 28, with films like A Girl in Every Port. Second, the meteoric year of 1929 in Europe at age 23. And finally, the mid-30s, back in Hollywood, in a brace of B-Westerns like Overland Stage Raiders. Miss White, I believe. Oh, hello, Tony. Going my way? Maybe. What's the percentage? Interesting company guaranteed. It never fails. When Stoney meets a gal, we meet trouble. Hello, boys. Conversely, it was the gal here who had met trouble, Louise Brooks, proprietress of one of the shortest stardoms in the industry, 12 years in all, and only four years in ascendancy. This 1938 Oter would be her last film. John Wayne's next would be Stagecoach. Contract instead of him. Well, aren't you going to say anything? About what? Oh, the excitement. What? I didn't know there was any in this town. Then I guess you haven't heard the news. Oh, you mean about Ned? I'm way ahead of you. The finance company has probably repossessed our plane by now. I guess we'll be leaving Oro Grande soon. You've got another guest coming. You haven't lost your plane. You've taken on three new partners, and we're going to get a big new transport. Really? Symbolically, Wayne was wrong, and Brooks was right. Career-wise, she was by then a loser at age 32. A classic film industry instance of rapid ascent and even more rapid decline. Lulu.